Hi guys, given that the last video about the joystick interface I'm calling part 6, this is Freedom Platform Detailed Hardware Build Part 7. At the end of part 5 we left off with this schematic where we made a couple of little adjustments to the LCD board, primarily changing the uh, shift register clock pin from port B bit 1 to port A bit 1. So on the physical microcontroller we changed it from this vacant pin to where the green wire is connected to port A bit 1. Logically following the joystick we might as well get onto the joystick parallel input shift register 74HC165 or HCT variant 74HCT165. Not that it necessarily matters, but all of the logic and the comparator that I've used in all of these prototypes has been Texas Instruments. The parallel shift register can take a snapshot of its own 8-bit input port and load that into its own memory and rotate it out serially so that the microcontroller can read that port with few pins. I'm connecting an 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor as close to the supply pin of the chip as possible between the supply and ground. So as I was saying, we use the parallel shift register to read 8 pins with only 3 pins, essentially, and that helps the microcontroller branch out, spread little fingers out into the real world in the same way that the LCD shift register is spreading the outputs. The chip's supply pin isn't a supply pin until we connect it to one, and in this section I made the error of connecting the supply to a 3.3 volt rail because this is a 3 volt board. Pin 16 is the supply pin, so there wasn't a mistake there. And next we're going to connect pin 8, which is the ground pin, to the ground rail directly. I'll go back and fix the positive supply later. You can see on this board that the MP3 module has a 5 volt supply and I'll borrow it from there. Pin 9 of the shift register is where serial data is output, one bit at a time. And it's connected to the DSPIC port B, bit 10 which is a 5 volt tolerant input pin. Pin 14 of the shift register is one of the input bits, bit 3, they call it D in the data sheets, and that's where the fire button will connect. Why I call it a fire button I don't know, when the only game Tetris doesn't have fire. I'll just call it the button, and the other end of the button wire is connected to an isolated pad near the edge of the board where a ribbon cable will connect it to the joystick. Pin 15 and pin 10 on the shift register can be grounded directly, so I'm going to bridge them with solder to a ground rail. Three more pins, 11, 12 and 13, or A, B, C, or bits 0, 1 and 2, I'm tying to ground temporarily here, and I'll leave that as a loose end for a future video in this series. The yellow wire here connected to pin 1 of the shift register will end up connected to the DSPIC port A, bit 0. The shift load control is needed to prevent the chip reading in parallel all the time overwriting its memory as it's being rotated out serially. The green wire connected to pin 2 is the clock pin and it will be connected to the DSPIC port A bit 1. That was the yellow wire being connected to port A bit 0 and the green wire is going to share port A bit 1 with the same wire that we moved from the uh, LCD module at the start of this video and the end of part 5. And this messy pad in the middle here is a 5 volt power supply that I dragged down from the top of the board and I'm going to lead power out to the joystick board as well. And that's also 5 volts. The last thing left to do with this chip is lead out a ribbon cable for the joystick so that'll be connected to down, up, right, left which is 3, 4, 5 and 6, the pins on the shift register, or EFGH. There's an extra wire on this ribbon cable to connect to the pad that we made before for the joystick button, which was connected to pin 14, the fire button. Pins 11, 12 and 13 that are still disconnected, I mentioned uh, for a future video, two of those are the card slot switch pins for write protect and card insert, and one of them is unused. These would all be connected to ground permanently if you were using a micro SD card socket that had no switches. The coloured points that are marked on the shift register schematic match the coloured points on the joystick schematic. I tried to take the joystick video very slowly because it might have a wider audience than uh, just the viewers for this project. 
The comparator circuit is a fairly recent addition. I've been previously doing something similar making resistor dividers using the resistance between the wiper and the end of tracks and the pull-up resistors to set a low voltage threshold directly at the inputs to the shift register. I like the new way better but it inverts all of the inputs so I've made the same modification to my original prototype. There's a little board underneath, I've got to figure out a way to secure that. We're going to use the pin we saved by controlling both shift register clocks with a single pin and use a transistor to switch power to the GPS module. This is a PNP transistor that will be switching the high side so I've got a wire here connected to the 3.3 volt rail from the circuit board. It's the correct voltage this time. There will be some voltage drop across the transistor but the U-Blocks GPS module has quite a wide tolerance it can get down to 2.7 volts. I know these three pads connecting the transistor to the board look like they're shorted but they're not. I can't really explain the way it looks. I'm connecting the 3.3 volt supply to the transistor emitter here. This is a 330 ohm resistor connected between the base of the transistor and an isolated pad and that isolated pad will go on to be connected to the DS pick port B bit 1. That's the now vacant pin on the DS pick that we saved. I'm preparing a pad here for where the GPS module will receive its power supply. This is a fairly new feature for my original prototype as well, so software can now turn on and off the GPS module to save battery life. This is where we're up to now. The unit on the right is slightly ahead of the other just because it has the transistor. Onto the GPS module, this couldn't be any simpler, I don't need any uh, EEPROM or battery backup and the default settings are fine with me so I don't have to talk to it, uh, so there's no transmit line wasting an IO pin. I've got one of these units built on a circuit board but it's one of these things where it might be cheaper just to buy the pre-built module from eBay. This will be the only marked difference between the two prototypes. I'm planning to use this for one of them and then buy a pre-built module for the other. So here's the cable I've put together to mount the patch antenna slightly away from the unit. This horrific mess that I'm making is not only securing the daughter board to the main PCB, but it's providing the ground connection for the daughter board. The GPS module power supply pin will connect to the collector of the transistor that we placed just before. And that one's a bit frosty, not happy with that, went back and fixed it. The yellow wire here is the GPS serial transmit pin, and I'm connecting that to an isolated pad, but it will be connected onto the DS pick port B bit 11. I've just connected the antenna input for the GPS module to the center of the coax connector here. And the outside part for the sheath of the coax is grounded to the circuit board. This GPS module did have an extra 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor across its own supply on its own little daughter board. Making the connection we were talking about before, this is the GPS transmit signal, which from the microcontroller's point of view is GPS receive, and that's the way I talk about it in software, and that was port B bit 11. Backing up to the GPS module schematic a bit, the one nanofarad capacitor shown in series with the antenna is really only needed for any sort of loop antenna such as a QFH antenna. 
Standing back again, we can see where we're up to on the bottom PCB, the 3.3 volt circuit board. We're ready to test the GPS module with software and there's little to go with the project. Battery holders, batteries, regulators and the soft power switch. I'm using a ceramic antenna assembly that I've previously put together and before the GPS module gets a position fix it does get the time and then later on we get a position fix and I've got the pulse per second frequency output connected to an LED so we can see that fix. Looking at this video before doing the voiceover, I really liked the uh, pace of this one, probably more so than the others. I hope you do too. Catch us next time.